Okay, we're going to kick off. Um, my guest today is Anna Heslop, who is the head of wildlife and habitats at Clients Earth, uh, an organization that requires no introduction. Um, and I am particularly delighted to have her um, on the show today, partly because um, as a lawyer myself and as a lawyer who's been involved in a fair amount of struggles for social justice, um, I am professionally enormously interested in how the law can be used um, as a lever for social change. Um, and so, Anna, I'm going to start um, at a kind of macro, macro level and then hope that we'll zoom down to um, a, a more specific set of examples. And um, before we went live, I asked you, um, firstly, just, just give a sort of a minute long summary of how client earth works and what your theory of change is. And then I want you to reflect on whether the pandemic is likely to make your work harder or easier. And I'm certain that what you will begin to say is easier in some respects and harder in others. And I'd like to know where that balance lies because um, I think the, the overarching theme of Build Back Better is to say, how do we on the balance sheet of losses versus gains in the face of this pandemic, and let's stipulate that the losses far outweigh the gains, um, that we concentrate on the gains and put pressure and effort and attention on the gains to try and restore some equilibrium or in the most optimistic scenario, try and achieve a better outcome from this really terrible and tragic circumstance. So start off by giving us a sense of what you do and then tell us a little bit about how it's gonna be harder or easier as we go forward. Sorry, I'm muting myself. Um, uh, thank you very much, Paul, for, for the introduction and thank you for having me today. So, so just a kind of overview of, of how client uh, works we are we are lawyers acting on behalf of the environment so we're a non-profit organization and we try to take uh, a kind of a, a whole uh, whole law approach so so we do everything from making sure that the right laws are in place in the first place and that we have the right policies in place right the way through to um, making sure those laws are implemented and then going through to making sure those laws get enforced. So the kind of sexy bit of that is the litigation that we do where we bring cases against companies or, or legal interventions against governments um, to try to enforce those laws and make sure that people are, are um, implementing them properly. But we also do a lot of squirreling around in the background, making sure that the right laws are in place. Um, and, and all of that work continues through COVID. We, we've managed to sort of work from home, all of us, and, and keep, keep things going. Um, and actually, it's been quite a busy time um, because uh, there are, as you say, ways in which this will make our lives easier or potentially have, have much better outcomes. So people feel weirdly, having been locked in their homes, they feel a bit more connected with nature. We're seeing um, you know, people realizing how much they rely on the environment around them. Uh, we're seeing uh, less pollution in some cases. We're seeing much better kind of air quality on our city streets. People are really feeling that and, and seeing a different way that the world might be able to work. Um, there's a sort of slight balance to that in that the, the, the answer isn't that everybody stays locked in their homes so that wildlife can survive. We need to find a kind of a middle ground and an equilibrium. So we have to be quite careful about how we, how we message the, the benefits of that, but it's certainly people are feeling it more. Um, and so there is an opportunity when we look at kind of economic recovery, how we get out of this um, uh, current terrible situation to make sure that where we put the investment is into the right things. There is equally a risk that the investment will go into the wrong things. So, so government's sort of uh, standard response to an economic crisis is to kind of encourage um, infrastructure projects, encourage projects which will kickstart the economy. And those infrastructure projects sometimes can be quite damaging. The, the standard classic thing that they look at is new roads, you know, um, new airport, how do we get more kind of economic activities like that? And, and those sorts of things will be 
potentially quite sort of damaging. So making sure that, first of all, the, the laws that we have in place right now are not rolled back. So we're kind of monitoring what's happening all over the world in terms of emergency measures that are being put in place, which, some of which are very, very important for COVID, but some of which are a backdoor for governments to downgrade environmental protection. So we're monitoring some of that quite carefully and we will take interventions to stop those um, at the right moments, um, but also to make sure that the recovery packages are actually as green and as forward looking as they could possibly be. So, I mean, obviously you have an offensive game and a defensive game. The defensive yeah. game is to preserve existing standards and to ensure that they're not rolled back under the cover of the night. Um, and, you know, in some ways, you as lawyers, I mean, it's our job as citizens and voters and, and activists to ensure that, you know, governments don't roll things back. And then there's kind of offensive game, which is to say, this is the moment, if there's any of time in history where new standards are important and that we up our game and that we condition any investments or infrastructure build on a green lens or a do no harm lens at, at, at the very least. Um, are you seeing any areas where you think the offensive new standards are potentially coming into play that would be useful or is that a project, you know, if you were to sit down and draft something for us over a couple of weeks and then say, go to it, this is the laws we need. Um, are there things in the pipeline that you think are, are, are useful, could usefully be implemented? So, so there are certainly some really useful things around sort of uh, state aid coming up in the EU that we're looking at quite carefully. So the EU is planning a big recovery package and that will include, you know, providing money to, to companies to try to kickstart a sort of economic recovery. We're looking at that very carefully to try to make sure that whatever they propose fits not only with the state aid rules, which are the rules around how, how much governments are allowed to give to companies to, to give them a competitive advantage, but also that those fit with all of the environmental regulations that we already have. So they're not just sort of handing out money to build a new motorway through the middle of a protected area and then once the money's come in from the EU it's very unlikely that the EU is going to bring um, you know kind of enforcement uh, procedure to stop the country from building the motorway through the protected area right because it financed it so so there is there is some of that that we're doing that we're we're already kind of getting into the into the detail um, of some of those things in terms of new uh, policies um, a lot of what we're doing is at EU level so I'm I will speak in EU terms but it's equally applicable in the UK or in any of the any of the individual countries and and also of course around the world um, the EU we we're in we're in a very lucky situation in fact um, there was a new European Commission came in like late last year and they have put right at the heart of their agenda the environment so they have this whole the, the first thing they did was within the first hundred days of coming into office was come up with a new green deal for europe which is this kind of huge policy raft of policies that will hopefully make europe more green and more sustainable going forward covering climate change waste chemicals farming um, biodiversity the whole lot we were all kind of a little bit taken aback because the previous commission had one line in its um, in its entire mandate which said we'll consider sustainable development or something so this is a really huge leap forward but that that green deal encompasses a whole raft of policies which the EU is now scrambling to draft and some of those were due to come out in kind of February March time and have been delayed and we know there's a lot of sort of argy-bargy going on inside um, the commission about how we still do those green things but do them in a way that doesn't make farmers throw their hands up or fishermen throw their hands up and say this is impossible you're putting new regulation on us at a time when we're in an economic crisis so we're working quite hard across all of the topic areas that we work on on environment to make sure that those new laws or new policies are not downgraded because of COVID and actually that, that COVID helps to push them to be more ambitious. Let's now focus a little bit on your work that you've done previously on, on, on fisheries and protecting the marine eco ecosystem. I know you've done two forms of work, one about plastics and the other on sort of um, stopping 
um, bycatch or waste and, and other ways of kind of properly regulating fisheries to ensure that we have healthy marine ecosystems. Can you talk a little bit about that prior work and then um, perhaps give us a sense of where you think the new frontiers are, both in relation to plastics and, and, and fisheries? Yeah, so, so on plastics, um, the EU has, uh, it took a long time to sort of wake up to the problem of marine plastic. So, so plastic waste obviously is all around in our environment, but an awful lot of it ends up in the sea. And it has a huge impact on marine life because the, the, the particles kind of break down these microplastics, they get into the fish, they get into the turtles. Sometimes, you know, we find seals on the beach that have died and their stomachs are full of plastic because they thought it was a jellyfish and they ate it. Or, you know, you've probably seen all of these sort of terrible pictures in the last sort of two years there's been a huge sort of increase in the the awareness of that and and the european parliament in its in its last incarnation before the last european election passed a whole raft of, of legislation to try to control the use of single-use plastics it's the most ambitious kind of um legislation on single-use plastics anywhere in the world and so uh, we're very pleased about that and it's something that, that um, colleagues of mine worked very hard to make sure we got in place. It's obviously not the end of the story because you get the right laws in place and then you've got to make sure that, that kind of people follow through. So one of the things that we're looking at in our sort of plastic strategy now is, is actually how do we cut off the sort of plastics industry so that we get less plastic in the environment. And so we have a whole team that work on industrial emissions and have been going around shutting down coal-fired power stations um, all over the world and they are now looking at some of these factories that sort of um, produce plastic and um, plastic cracking plants when they when they make plastic it comes in tiny tiny little pellets um, which they then put into a big machine I'm not a scientist but they put into a big machine and turn into plastic and these tiny pellets as they're sort of taking them out of the truck or moving them around the factory just sort of float out into the atmosphere um, and they end up in the sea and they end up on the beaches and they end up uh, in the environment so if you can reduce uh, if you can if you can tackle the sort of environmental issues around permitting those sorts of um, uh, those sorts of plants you can then have an impact on the kind of global supply chain of plastic and actually not producing new plastic but but push the industry towards using more recyclables or, or more um, sustainable materials so that's one that's the sort of plastic side on the fishing and bycatch side we've done quite a lot of work so so bycatch for those who don't know is is when fishermen fisher people go out and and do their fishing um, inevitably certain things get caught up in the nets that were not the stock that they were looking for um, and EU rules mean that they they have to throw that stuff back overboard they're not allowed to land certain species so if you're busy sort of trying to catch uh, you know the classic one is tuna and then dolphins get caught up in the net um, dolphins die you fling them back over the side of the boat and you know that's the fisher person doesn't worry too much about it but it's a huge issue for the species and it's one of the main threats to um, kind of marine protected species as well as protected areas so we've done quite a lot of work in in trying to make sure that um, uh, where there are sort of uh, bycatch issues happening that those are being properly monitored by the countries where the, the fish are landed and that the proper sort of um, measures are put in place to reduce the bycatch as much as possible. So you can do that by using particular type of nets. They, they have to fish in certain ways. Um, you know, certain types of fishing are much more destructive than others. You know, when they do these big trawl fishings where they just sort of drag, drag the net right along the bottom of the ocean, that tends to be a lot worse than kind of line fishing where they throw a line in and the fish come and nibble on it and then you hike them out. So, um, we've done quite a lot of work on bycatch and on, we, on on making kind of strategic complaints to the European Commission so that they can hold member states to account so there is a procedure called uh, the infringement process where as a citizen if you think a country in Europe is not um, uh, complying with its obligations to uh, under EU law you can complain to the European Commission and they can take that forward as an infringement and Client Earth does quite a lot of what we call strategic complaints to the European Commission where we we're very careful to make sure that we're drafting those complaints in a way that the Commission can use to get the right legal precedent that we then need to be able to go and enforce ourselves at national level. I'm, I'm fascinated by your, to come back to plastics and then to emerge, 
you've been yeah. doing some work on trying to place boards under an obligation to take material business risks into account in dealing with plastics and single use plastics in mm -hmm. particular. Mm -hmm. um, what's the status of that? Because I think in some ways, if, if that became a norm and every board had to say, you know, we have single use plastics in our, in our supply chain and we are at some degree of legal risk unless we seek to reduce it. I think that would be a very, very interesting uh, strategy to deploy in loads of different ways. Yeah. So, so um, I have to confess that's not. I'm not the expert on our company and financial work, but I do know um, that we do a whole lot of of, uh, of work on trying to make sure um, that we are we are that the companies are taking into account the risks from a whole raft of things: climate change, their impact on biodiversity, chemicals that are in their supply chains, plastics. So, so what's always traditionally happened in kind of campaigning towards companies is that you say to the company, you're doing a terrible thing, please stop doing it because we as the public want you to stop doing it. And what our company finance team has done is kind of flipped that on its head and said, well, actually, that's fine. But actually, company, you should be worried about the risks to you. So not the risk to the environment or the risks to the public but actually there are material risks to your business of continuing with this business model. So if you are producing plastic and you know that um, it's having an impact on the environment and you know that it's unsustainable, that there is a risk to the company in that, that plastic, you know, potentially there might be, um, there might be some legal risks further down the line. If, you know, we end up with cases like we had with big tobacco or, um, you know, there are risks to the company's operating model because you can't just keep churning out unsustainable uh, plastic and hoping that no one will notice. You know, Walker's Crisps had this issue last year where people started to send the crisp packets back to them through the mail and they got millions of crisp packets through the mail and they finally had to say, OK, we'll recycle them it's fine we'll make them recyclable so so there are sort of reputational risks as well as actually financial risks to companies and it's it's about sort of highlighting those to them uh, and making sure that they're reporting on things properly so they are taking those risks into account i was very interested in your comments on the coal-fired power plants and, and and air quality um um last week we had jane burston who's head of the clean air fund talking mm -hmm. about clean air in the COVID context and um it's my continued contention and has been so since the very first day of this, that um, there is no better moment in human history than now to campaign on the importance of, of clean air. Mm -hmm. um, part, partly because of the fact that we're going to have millions of people who will emerge from the coronavirus with, um, I think, ongoing limited respiratory you know ailments uh, and secondly because people got used to the wonderful nature of clean air and not having diesel fumes in our noses um, yeah. and thirdly because there's some risks around you know pollution conveying uh, the coronavirus on particles unproven but if there's any risk of that that's terrifying so yeah. do you do you think that there is an opportunity to kind of double down on your clean air work and closing coal fire power plants in the wake of corona do you, do you, are you seeing any added possibilities there i think i think it's a kind of it's a it's a careful balance that that our clean air team are trying to strike so between um uh, pushing on clean air issues at a time when uh, you know so some of our clean air, clean air cases inevitably involve public health um parts of governments so when we take legal cases against governments, it's the public health department often that is having to deal with those. And so at the moment, we're a little bit sensitive to the fact that pushing too hard right now will take resources away from dealing with the COVID outbreak itself. But as soon as those sort of states of emergency start to come out and the lockdowns start to come out, our clean air team is ready to pounce. <laughs> um, because you're quite right. Um, it's it's a moment where the public is very very aware of it but also it's a real opportunity to kind of show people that you don't need to drive your car to work every day you know part of what we have been saying in our clean air work is there are there are other ways of living which the government needs to help the governments of all of these countries need to help people to adapt to and 
who knew that we could all suddenly manage to work from home overnight? You know, I know not everybody, I realize not everybody, but so many people have managed to work from home overnight and they're seeing the benefits of that. You're not, you're not sort of cramming yourself onto a, a, a tube train and breathing in, I mean, a horrendous air quality inside the tube system. Um, in terms of coal-fired power stations, I think it's a slightly different question because um, you know, the energy transition and, and the impacts of climate change is something that we're all going to have to kind of deal with regardless. And um, COVID doesn't sort of make that any, it might, in fact, might make it slightly better because nobody's been flying for a, for a few weeks. So the, the, the emissions will come down slightly. Although one of my colleagues was telling me that actually the emissions from these server farms where we're all using so much internet, um, the energy emissions there are going up. So um, uh, we have to be we have to be a little bit uh, careful about the balance there, but but I think it's very clear for us that 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 sort of energy transition away from coal has to happen regardless. Um, and there are air quality issues around coal, but there are a whole raft of issues around around coal fired power stations. Uh, uh, you know, in addition to air quality. Let me let me ask you a question about the forthcoming convention on biological diversity, and you were telling us a little bit about that earlier, um, and how that is a very interesting source of kind of legal activism and and international standard setting. So give us a little bit of a background about what it is, what's yeah. forthcoming, and how that might be an opportunity to kind of get at some important climate and sustainability issues. Yeah, so the Convention on Biological Diversity was signed about 30 years ago. It's a, it's a big convention. It's ratified by most of the countries in the world. I think the US is the big exclusion because they, they're not so into protecting biological diversity in the US. But fine, we have everyone else, Brazil and all sorts of lovely, very biodiverse, rich countries. Um, uh, that 10 years ago they set a bunch of targets um, under that convention called the HE targets and they were very sensible targets they were things like reducing overfishing um, making sure we reduce the impacts of illegal wildlife trade Santa de Marche the day before the trial to ensure that there was maximum pressure and then you would do three weeks of mass marches to ensure that there was maximum pressure and you would then send you know notes to companies saying that there'd be sanctions if these people were executed and then you would have your court case and it was all coordinated. Do you, yeah. obviously there's a division of labor in the, in, in, amongst activists trying to achieve change, but do you view that as part of your job or do you sort of do your work and rely on other people to do that work? Yeah, so, so, so we, we acknowledge that the sort of the law is only one of the tools in the toolkit, right? And in order to get kind of systemic change, you need to use all of those, all of those tools. Um, we sort of see ourselves as the legal expert. We do do a certain amount of campaigning. So we, we have a, a very sort of uh, amazing campaigner on air quality who works in London. Um, we have people who work with businesses. So, so we have a seafood, sustainable seafood team that kind of work with businesses to try to make sure that they are, um, you know, using only buying fish that comes from sustainable uh, practices and so on so we have those sorts of different parts of our our um our work but actually most of what we do we do in partnership with other ngos so as an example we are we are working uh, towards a case in um uh, in lisbon in portugal where the portuguese government wants to build an airport on the edge of an estuary it's one of the most important bird migration areas uh, in the world. Um, birds come from Africa to Northern Europe and they stop over in this estuary in Lisbon and the uh, Portuguese government wants to build an airport on the edge of the estuary. And uh, so unfortunately if you build an airport next to an estuary it's quite a risky thing to do because birds taking off where jumbo jets taking off it's not a great combination and they tend to fall out the sky. The jumbo jets full of people. Um, so they can't just destroy the area where the airport is. They have to actually scare the birds off the entire estuary. So you have to destroy all of the habitat to make it safe for planes to take off and land. So it's a really major case for us in terms of impacts on biodiversity, impacts on species that travel long distances. So that could be birds, but it could also be marine mammals. It could be sharks and whales. If we, if we get a bad precedent there, it will have an impact on a whole load of species, including kind of marine species. So it's a very important case for us, and we're going to take some kind of um, experimental arguments in that case to say, actually, you shouldn't just 
um, look at the impact on the environment in Lisbon, you have to look at the impact on the environment at every site along that migration route, so all the way up to Finland. Um, and uh, it's an exciting case for us, and I'm a legal geek, so I love my legal geek case, but we're working in that case with eight NGOs. Um, <clears throat> from a bird NGO, a climate change NGO, there's one that works on air quality, there's a citizens group that are really uh, worried about traffic and noise, there's a, a group that are worried about safety because you know if planes are going to fall out of the sky that's obviously quite a big safety issue for people who live in Lisbon. So, so they are sort of take, they take on some of the campaign work, we work with them on that and make sure the messages are right and then we do the legal work. Um, so, so we do that uh, and, and obviously they bring us some of their scientific knowledge as well and their, and their sort of local knowledge because for legal cases that's hugely important, you know, making sure that you have the local context and you have their scientific knowledge. So, so we do work on most of our legal cases, we work in coalition with, with other groups. So um, we're kind of out of time but Caroline has had a really great question which I'm going to put as a kind of uh, okay. um, epilogue and that mm -hmm. is... Um, she did a lot of what we've spoken about is EU regulation, and she wanted yeah. to know um, what this um, pesky little thing called Brexit uh, mm -hmm. is going to do to your work in this country in yes. relation to leveraging what is uh, the kind of advances or the higher standards that are emerging out of Europe. And how yeah. So, so the the way that the brexit deal is currently negotiated and let's see what happens who knows what might happen over the next six months but the way it's currently worded all of the existing eu law at the date when we leave the eu automatically comes over into uk law the uk government can then if it wants to start unpicking some of that and so i have a team of colleagues in london who are wonderful and are watching very carefully at the unpicking and trying to make sure that it doesn't downgrade um, the kind of protections that we already have uh, from the eu in the uk and in fact they brought a judicial review last year against um, the government on marine protected areas because it was trying to sort of undo some of the um, marine protected areas protections um, and we that case it, it was a bit of a strange outcome in that case because we, we sort of neither won or lost but the government agreed to go away and um, rewrite its guidance to make it clear that it wasn't going to downgrade EU law so good good result for nature and we, we got the sort of right outcome in that case um, and they will watch those things very closely in terms of the sort of new policies that will come out of the EU or new uh, procedures. I think there's an opportunity, there, there, there is a risk of a race to the bottom, right, if the, if the UK decides that it wants to be deregulatory because it needs to get the economy going and so it's going to let businesses do whatever they want and it's going to downgrade pollution standards and all sorts of things like that, that's a big risk because then Europe will see this sort of country off its border becoming more competitive and there will be a sort of a, a, a motivation for Europe to also let companies do things like that otherwise the companies go abroad so that's a risk but actually there's also a sort of a potential for a race to the top <laughs> so if Europe comes up with lots of really ambitious goals and and lots of really ambitious work that it's going to do and then it looks at the sort of dirty next door neighbor that's doing terrible things it gives us leverage to be able to go to the UK and say will you you know you have to make a success of Brexit, but you have to not do it at the cost of the environment because people won't accept that. Um, and that's one of the things that we're doing in the CBD process, actually, is kind of trying to make sure that they know when the other one's being more ambitious because they don't, they don't want to be seen as being less ambitious than the EU. Um, and the EU doesn't want to be seen as being less ambitious than the Brits. So we can sort of push them to be a bit more, <laughs> um, a bit more helpful by comparing them in, in a sort of, you know, they're doing something more positive than you way. So yeah, it's, it remains to be seen what will happen in the next six months with the sort of Brexit negotiations, but we're hopeful. And of course, there's always a little sidebar on whether you can uh, implement sort of cross-border carbon tariffs and uh, all of that sort of stuff, which I, I think is a really interesting um, mm. Opportunity and 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 a piece of innovative um, linking trade to kind of uh, environmental law, mm. but I'm afraid that is all we have time for. And I just wanted to end by saying, um, just amazingly powerful and interesting work. And I I just love the 
the integration between all the kind of civil society actors and NGOs and movement people with law playing a part uh, alongside a whole series of theories of change. And um, mm. Client Earth does such remarkable work and I'm determined to get your clean air person, uh, air quality person on as well and kind of dig into that because I think that there's just a massive opportunity there. Oh, I'm sure he'd be delighted to. He has, he has a... He has lots of lovely stories to tell about air quality, so I'm sure he'd be delighted. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for all your work and uh, bon chance, and we'll continue to to support, uh, put our shoulder to the wheel, and uh, and uh, and support support you along the way. Excellent. Thank you very much, and nice to see you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Stay safe and stay well.